Shalom Kharim, I'm Stephen Vernoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. And uh, here today, friends, we have a very special guest, uh, Steve Quell, with us. And, you know, we've been getting into this subject about the Nephilim or the fallen angels, the Raphaim, the different types of giants that are on the earth. And, of course, as I mentioned to you several times here recently, uh, looking at the prophecy that Jesus says in Matthew 24 is that it appears that we are going to have a repeat of these giants coming here in the last days. As Jesus clearly says when he talks about the wars, rumors of wars, the nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, that was only the beginning of sorrows. So what's coming next? He goes into a little bit further in the chapter. He talks about uh, around verse 35 or so that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. He talks about the eating, the drinking, the giving, the giving in marriage as we've shared with you. Go back to Enoch, you find out what they were eating. It was human beings. They were drinking human blood and the marriages were not necessarily consensual marriages either. And today we're going to really get deeper into this, and I want uh, Steve Quell, our brother here, to just have all the time he needs to share with you some incredible insights that he has. I know many of you know him, you've listened to him on different broadcasts all over the world. He's written many, many books, and uh, I'm just really excited to have the opportunity to share with him today, or share you, him with you guys here today, here on Israeli News Live. So, Steve, God bless you. Thank you, my brother, for coming on here with us today. And we look forward to things that you have to say. Well, thank you, Stephen. One of the first things we got to do is deal with a couple terms. The first term is Nephilim. A lot of people misuse that. They call demons Nephilim. They call giants Nephilim. Nephilim, as you know, is translated in Genesis 6 and also Numbers 13, uh, 32 and 33 as giants. But the correct, as I understand it from people who are scholars like yourself, it means those who descend from the fallen ones, the, the root word Nepal or Nepal, I may be pronouncing it wrong. The Bible's very clear that after the second incursion of uh, fallen angels, the Bible, as a matter of fact, Genesis 6 says uh, there were giants in those days and after those days. That means before the flood and after the flood. And as one of, I'd say, the most uh, focused researchers in the world on the idea of giants and the whole, if you will, history of the world as it relates to giants, there's two different sizes we're going to deal with. The pre-flood giants were bigger than the post-flood giants. The largest post-flood giant we know of in the Old Testament is King Og of Bashan, the land of the giants. And what's important for people to understand, you just quoted Matthew 24 a minute ago. Matthew 24 is very clear that men's hearts are going to fail them for fear of looking after those things coming up, UP, on the earth. We know in Matthew 24, it's coming up on the earth, and in, in the book of Revelation, it's coming down on the earth. Woe unto you inhabitants of the earth, for your enemy, or the devil, has great wrath, knowing that his time is short. And I think to put this into perspective, people have got to understand, we are not talking about large human beings, of which many of the circus freaks were, and they may have had a, a glandular disorder, but we're talking about historic reality and people and those giants whose bones are even with us today. And Stephen, you can put up the giant skull that we'll be displaying at uh, Branson at the True Legends Conference this year in September. But I think it's critical that people understand we're not talking about just something in a fantasy book, a fairy tale, the book of Enoch, Dead Sea Scrolls, the book of Giants, Dead Sea Scrolls, all the different ancient writings deal about this. And so here's one of the things that I want to clear up right away. Nephilim, and this is this will help people with clarity, are the fallen angels, and those are the progenitor of the giants. The giants, from that point on, after the flood of Noah, are referred to as the Raphaim, the Rapha. They're even referred to, as you and I were talking before we went on the, the show today, that the dead, shall the dead rise to praise thee? So when you add all those up, I think I did, and guess what? They come out to be about 33 mentions in the Old Testament. So it's a big deal to deal with what we're talking about. Big deal, pun intended. Now I'm going to read everybody to set the stage for our interview. Isaiah 13, 1 through 3, in the Septuagint. The vision which Isaiah, son of Amos, saw against Babylon, lift up a standard on the mountain plain, exalt the voice to them, beckon with the hand, open the gate, ye rulers. Those are not normal rulers, okay? I give command, and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath, rejoicing at the same time and insulting. Now, what did Jesus tell us? Jesus told us, 
that the gates of hell would not prevail. So this is talking about a period where God is going to allow the judgment on a God-rejecting uh, uh, population of the world to come forth. So again, now imagine this, and then we'll go wherever you want to go. Imagine that the extractable DNA of some of these mummified giants is intact enough to recreate uh, if you will, the Jurassic giants. I'm not talking about dinosaurs, but I'm just using that. Everyone is familiar with Jurassic Park. But the ability to basically take uh, the, quote, stasis-like DNA and recreate a super being. And so the, the thing that is critical for people to understand is this is the book of Isaiah, the Septuagint, is, you know, obviously the Greek version of the Old Testament, the first five books, the Tanakh. And I think the bottom line is, is that it's not, it's not fantasy. We're not dealing with something that's far out. And here's the question, too. Let's get this out, and then we'll go for it. This is an introduction. Jesus said, in heaven they are neither given or taken in marriage, but are as the angels. We're not talking about heavenly angels. We're talking about uh, fallen angels. A third of the angels fell. Isaiah 14, how art thou fallen? And the thing is, is that I, I believe it's critical, Stephen, that people get this because everything now that we used to see in the future of supernaturalism is here on the planet now. Things are getting more bizarre, and the idea of, of uh, transhumanism and transgenics taking genes from different species and crossing the borders in the book of Genesis, everything that God created, he put borders for everything, and he created everything after its likeness and kind. And so what the devil tried to do, obviously, by polluting the seed of woman, is to prevent the redemption of, or the, of the Redeemer through Jesus Christ. So at this point, this, I think this is critical. I think it's so critical that if you were to ask me, Steve, after all the years you've been at this, 45 years, whatever, what is the thing you would say to people? I'd say this. It's happening before your eyes. All the denial in the world isn't going to keep you from dealing with it. The transhumanist agenda is basically simply this. God did a crummy job making human beings, and we're going to do a better job. Now, that sounds just like uh, the Prince of Darkness to me. And so when you're talking about the dead, uh, I think in the uh, Isaiah, shall the dead rise to praise thee, that word is the Raphaim, the Valley of Rapha, the Valley of the Giants. And then you and I were talking, Stephen, about all the different Zanzumans and all the different things that end in I am, or maybe Zanzumin. But the point is, is that this is critical. We're in the days of Noah, and if Jesus said it's going to be that bad, and I really want to thank you for bringing this up, these guys weren't just eating and drinking, you know, beer and barley. They were eating human beings and drinking their blood. And now, why is that relevant? Because all of the pedogate revelations, all of the uh, uh, information coming out of Hollywood, their satanic ritual feasts and all this stuff, it's right back to that. So whom you yield yourselves to, that's whose servant you become. That's exactly right. And you know, Steve, you brought up uh, Isaiah's prophecy there, Isaiah 14. And it, I figured, because you've done so much research, most of these things you were already aware of. Uh, but it was something that I had just discovered myself in, in Isaiah's prophecy in uh, chapter 14. But this is the famed biblical prophecy that we often see when it speaks about, you know, uh, Satan, you know, thou, thou son of the morning, how have you fallen? But what's really interesting, and for me it's easy to, to read it in Hebrew, but if I'm not looking over in the English Bible, if I don't have an English uh, or transliteration beside me, I may not see it. I may forget that you're not seeing this as well, but verse 9 uh, and, and looking at this in the English right here, the netherworld from beneath is moved for thee to, to, to meet you at your coming. Now this is talking about the son of the morning. This is Satan coming down. Now they translate the shades are stirred up unto you, but it's literally right here is Raphaim. Okay, so the, the Raphaim, they are stirred up. And even, watch this here, all the chief ones of the earth are all the, literally the kings of the earth here is what you're having that's written in here which is the world leaders. You know, I mean, Steve, I, tell me your thoughts on something here that really baffles me. And I'm not trying to pick on Catholic people by no means when I say this, but when the Pope of Rome says he's willing to baptize uh, aliens, and he says, to make it clear, yeah, the little green men from Mars, uh, and then he has this secret meeting with Kirill in uh, Havana, Cuba, 
And still to this day, no one has ever, to my knowledge anyway, no one has ever known what the meeting was. It was never disclosed what the details were about, but Creel does go to Antarctica right there afterwards. Uh, and, you know, some people might say, well, that was really no big deal, you know, and they, they talk about what was in some kind of a conspiracy, conspiracy uh, theory website that said that they moved the Ark of Gabriel down there. Well, you know, my wife speaks fluent Russian. Uh, she was just there watching a whole series of Russian, uh, a Russian uh, movie there recently here. No problem. Re listens to everything. We were searching the Russian media when this all went down. Russian media never considered it a theory or a conspiracy. They did send the scientific uh, ship down there. They did claim that the Ark of Gabriel goes down there. And it wasn't on Russia 1, but it was a credible Russian news source. And these things did happen. So Kirill goes there. John Kerry goes there. All these things happen here, but I, I can probably get way off here. But my point is, is that we look here at at uh, Isaiah 14, Yeshayahu, we're looking at this. What's really interesting is that he's talking about the Raphaim coming up once again. And they were clearly, as Steve has pointed out to you here, they were clearly on the earth. We know this. This is what uh, Joshua, what Moses even fought against these giants. Uh, the children of Esau did. The children of Lot were fighting against them. David as well, all the way down through, through the time there. Uh, so Steve, you know, if you can elaborate a little bit about this, because we're looking at world leaders that are involved in this. Uh, excuse me. Yes, and the deal, the, you have to have something of infinite interest to drag all these. The Pope was there, by the way, so was Barack Obama. So were so yes. many people have gone down there. And, and it's my contention, uh, Stephen, when I wrote the book, Empire Beneath the Ice, How the Nazis Won World War, uh, too, that a lot of the, if you will, the run-ins they had with non-human entities are what prompted them to move one-third of the Third Reich's technology and scientists down to what uh, is termed, they termed New Schwabenland. Most people don't realize we went to war with the Germans in 1947. Admiral Byrd led the flotilla, and according to eyewitnesses, including Russian spy ships, even in that day, we got our heads handed to us on a platter with flying saucer technology. And remember, this is 1947, the same year that Roswell happened. And there's a whole lot of science behind the statement. Now, isn't it interesting? You brought up the Pope baptizing aliens. First of all, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, died for those creating the image and likeness of the living God, the seed of Adam and Eve. The Bible's very clear about that. Even the fallen angels, as you know, you refer to the, uh, uh, excuse me, the book of Enoch, the Gregory are in hell. They're singing to God for forgiveness. And God says to Enoch, don't pray for them. They should be praying for you. And the point that I'm trying to make in this is Antarctica will be brought forth. Now, when I wrote that book two years ago, I said, you watch the headlines fill with news on Mars. Because how they're going to spin this is the aliens created us that basically they gave us God in their image, not being created in His, and that they're going to provide a celestial salvation based on technology and intervening in human affairs so that we don't you know, kill ourselves off. Now, first of all, the Pope is wrong. I'll say it again. The Pope is wrong. The Pope is wrong. The Pope is wrong based on the Bible. But this entity, it had, the Pope, has done everything he can. And again, I'm going to go on record. I have Catholic friends. I'm not talking about believers, Catholic believers. I am specifically exactly. talking about those who have made the statement. Uh, some of the smartest astrophysicists in the world believe this. Tom Horn has interviewed a couple of them. And the thing that is preposterous to me is the fact that something so anti-biblical could even be put forth as being a biblical precept, that aliens can be baptized. That's the same thing as saying that you move over the 12 disciples. Lucifer wants to become the 13th disciple. Oh, and by the way, that brings me to why Malachi Martin was murdered, the famous Catholic, Catholic uh, theologian. He was a very bright man. I think your wife speaks five languages. Yes. Malachi Martin spoke, what, 11 to 12, or maybe even as high as 16. But when he started writing his books, The Keys to This Blood, The Final Conclave, uh, you know, he started talking about the 13th chair that Lucifer literally sits in. Hence, you know, there's a lot of superstition with the number 13. By the way, that's why he was murdered. He didn't just die, he was murdered. 
Yes. So when people start to die, you got to ask yourselves, what were their leading themes up until the point they died? And now we're Murder, Inc. in this country, in this country, in every country of the world now. It's Murder, Inc. And God is absolutely showing, in my opinion, the sins of America, the sins of its leaders, and now nations that once held us in respect hold us in contempt. I believe the prophet Jeremiah said that you become a hissing in the nostrils of the nations around you. So the reason they're all headed down to Antarctica is to see something. There is a power source coming out of Antarctica. I don't mean a conspiracy source. I'm talking about a measurable amount of energy changing the oceans, changing the waves, changing the weather. And again, if, the, if when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he will have power to call down fire from heaven. Well, now we're seeing just in the last week, maybe you've dealt with it, but we're seeing uh, literally a particle beam or directed energy beam weapon uh, being so concise that you can't argue with it. It's not lightning. It's not uh, flashes of uh, uh, surface lightning. It's a directed energy weapon. So now we've got the issue that Satan himself is going to basically, he demands one thing, he demands worship. And what's tragic to me is, is that the entire movie industry has been preparing people for this day, the advent, the revealing, uh, the other words, you know, the initiation, the Luciferic initiation. So you know, Steve, the, real quick, yeah, not not to really interrupt because I, I don't like to do that, but I'd, I'd forget the thought. Sure enough, you say that Hollywood is bringing this out. Netflix just came out with this uh, movie with uh, I forget that Will is it Will Smith? I think is the guy's name. He's a uh, yes. black actor with all these different races of people and. I, I said, I, I'm like, I'm sitting there seeing this preview and I told my wife, I said, are they not trying to prepare you? It's, and I, and then I, uh, I took, I sat down and watched it. I wanted to see what it was about. And the one thing that was caught my attention was when these, I don't know what they considered themselves, I forget the names of it, but they, they said, we've been warring against them uh, or we defeated them 2,000 years ago. You know, Steve, they're definitely trying to get the minds of the people ready. And I think even with the children, they're trying to get the children to accept what's coming. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, here's the thing. If, if I could find any human being that doesn't find that it's not disgusting or won't speak up against it, I could probably find the whole Christian church. And I don't believe many synagogues are speaking up against the rabid cannibalism, the rabid child sacrifice the drinking of blood, and listen, when they brought the temple of Baal, how do you pronounce it, Baal or Baal? Some people pronounce it Baal, Baal. It, you know, Steve, that's funny. It's, it's, so many people get so worried about how you pronounce it. It doesn't really matter. English pronounces it Baal, I believe. And that's pretty, you know, yeah. Hebrew oh. doesn't matter. Baal is how you would say it in Hebrew, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, I, I hate getting I stuck on yeah. the names. There's too many people. Yeah, I mean, I read, I read, I say Yeshua because I'm Hebrew, but Jesus is, there's nothing wrong with Jesus either. You know, it doesn't matter which language. If you're, my wife uh, used to say, uh, what is it, Jesus or something like that from, from her country. You know, he knows what they are. So, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. The only reason I, I uh, refresh everyone's memory with that is they are having Canaanitish uh, religious ceremonies in the United States. Now, think back a couple of years, Stephen. Before that, we had Anubis, the Egyptian god, being paraded from New York to Denver, Colorado. And before that, we had the crystal skulls of the Mayan priests. So what escapes most people is, thou shall have no other gods before me, still stands in the Ten Commandments. Yet we have allowed foreign gods, and foreign gods are, in, in, uh, let's say, charged with one thing, to take the people of God eyes off of the living God. And therefore, we're, we're going to reap the whole destruction of uh, Deuteronomy 28, in my opinion. We well, are already. You know, that's, that's a very good point too, Steve, because uh, mm -hmm. something I've been dealing with on the news here recently more so is because of the war that we're doing in Syria. And it goes in perfectly in line with what you're talking about. Because we have to back up and find out what happened in Israel. For example, how, why did the house of Israel go into captivity uh, to begin with? It actually goes back to a prophecy that Jacob's father-in-law, Laban, actually made. And Laban, 
uh, he says this when he overtakes him, and uh, oddly enough, in, in the uh, right there, it's actually today, uh, that is considered, uh, oh gosh, what is it called there again? Um, Gilead. Gilead is in northwestern Jordan today. It was part of where the tribe of Dan was, but that was also where Bashan, where the giants were living at at that time. But that's not the point. Anyway, Laban made this odd prophecy, and most people never recognize it as a prophecy. He says to Jacob, if you take any other wives other than my daughters unto you, or if you afflict them in any way, God be a judge. Though we be apart, God be a judge between you and me. Now that never happens until Ahab marries Jezebel. That is the first time of the break in uh, the, 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 the kingly line there that it comes down. Ahab brings in Jezebel. She's a Zidonian. She, her father is the king of the Zidonians. And they are part of the Rephaim. They're part, uh, part of the giants of that time there. And that brought not only idolatry and the worship of Baal in, but it also brought that worship, a satanic worship of these giants to begin with. It's just exactly what Satan wants. And, and even in today, we have the same thing happening again today in Israel. So as to your point, that's... And we see with America this exact same thing, because what is America? Many of, many of the descendants of the house of Israel live here, I mean, all over the world, but here as well. And when we brought in Baal, you know, we bring this in and we parade it around the country, it's the demise of our nation. And I think that's the hardest thing for people to reference, because they can't equate cause and effect. And because Christians don't read their Bible, and I know a lot of... Uh, uh, Jewish uh, people that don't read uh, their Hebrew Bible or, you know, the Torah, the Tanakh. The thing is, is that they're unfamiliar with the very character and nature of the living God. God is holy. That word has no contemporary reference, nor do people understand it, I believe, anymore. He's separate, distinct, totally, though he created creation, he is above it all, and blessed be the name of the Lord, you know. What do the cherubim and seraphim do? They fall down and they cry, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is and was and is to come. And, and Jesus made it clear that call no man holy, save your Father which is in heaven. Because yes. the Catholic Church picked up on it called, you know, the Holy Father. Well, I got news for you. They need to redirect their attention. Again, that's not Catholic bashing. Uh, the scripture is clear, and it, it, at the end of the day, Stephen, the power of hell has so blinded the eyes of those who used to see, has so deafened the ears of those who used to hear, and has literally kicked the feet out of those who used to walk, proclaiming that righteousness. And, and you're 55, I'm, I'm, I'm 66, but there's a generation that's growing up that knew, knows not Joseph. There's a generation that's growing up that is absolutely terrified of Jesus because they, all they've heard is he's a bad guy because the video games portray Jesus. And, you know, the thing that's astonishing to me is how much now, and by the way, I've never played a video game in my life. I read the summaries of them, but it's all going supernatural. It's all going evil. And it's literally talking about the kingdom of hell reigning on earth and not the kingdom of God. So we're in for a battle that is going to be beyond my ability, yes. and I believe that only God can give an understanding. What we're doing is so critical, because by giving people the understanding of the Rephaim, the Nephilim, and let me use another word, demons. A demon is a disembodied spirit of a giant. Uh, yes. They wanted to go into this pigs when Jesus cast them out of the gathering demoniac. And notice this, they, they absolutely were terrified of the deep. And they said, have you come to torment us before our time? Now that tells me something. Demons, a disembodied spirit of a Rephaim, knows that their time is coming, okay? Even the book of Revelation, the devil knows his time is short. For the elect's sake, God is speeding up the days, so, you know, or there'd be no flesh left alive. So the words that I really want people to understand, again, is transhumanism and the hybrid age. I think that it's important for people to understand that Noah was the only one who was not genetically contaminated, Noah and his immediate family. They weren't morally perfect. We know how the story goes. But had God not spared them, he would have had to start over. And by the way, when Moses was given that opportunity, you know, and, and I, I tell people, if I'd been Moses, I would have had a hard time, you know, <laughs> saying, well, Lord, 
I think you should have just done it, you know, but that's okay. It's not okay. That's not what God wanted, but Moses had the heart of God in that. But I think it's important that people understand all of the fantasies, all of the uh, science fiction, no matter what genre. I'm a film major. I graduated from motion picture production in 1973 or 74 from MSU, a really good film school, in both motion picture production and still photography. And our duty was to basically understand from the very beginning of film all the way through and to be able to articulate and identify the themes of that art form. Remember, Marshall McLuhan made the statement, it's not the, it's not the a message within the medium, it's the very medium that is a message, i.e. Orwellian telepresence. I was just in Costco the other day, and I can't explain how weird it was. I've been in Costco, but uh, standing around the biggest TV screens in the whole store, I mean, these are big ones, 70, you know, maybe, I think the biggest was 80 inches, maybe 78, it was something, the biggest one. So many people stood there transfixed, just looking at the screens. And there's so much science, there's so much technology. I remember we first started talking about smart TVs, that they're spying on you. You would have thought that you just basically, you know, uh, slandered some guy's wife or mother in the most uh, scathing way because they didn't want to believe it. Then Samsung comes out and says, hey, your bedrooms aren't safe, cover your TVs, Samsung. So what I'm saying about this is that the telepresence is bringing you instances, I'm sorry, bringing instances and images of monsters into most people's bedrooms and lives, and they think, oh, it's just cute. The reason they're doing that, and you just mentioned it, Stephen, is to soften up people so when the real day appears, and I believe the scripture's admonition is, we cannot be, uh, uh, let's say, unaware of the uh, techniques of the devil. You know, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that I've kind of made myself notes on already. Uh, backing up just a little bit, because I want to get to the television screen as well. Uh, but the transhumanism, and this is something that my wife is really big into. She's a medical journalist. She's a nurse midwife. Uh, she studied at doctorate level for naturopathic medicine. Uh, she interviews doctors all over the world, etc. She's really gotten in. She did a lecture on transhumanism in Atlanta. I got a standing ovation, Steve. I, I wish I was as smart as her, but you know, it's okay. I'll, I'll keep my Alabama redneck self. Hey, 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 it's a smart man that marries a smarter woman. It's not the other way around. <laughs> there you go. That's right. So anyway, the thing about transhumanism that really got my attention, because one thing that Yana has been really focused on, uh, she had interviewed Harold uh, Kalsvilla, the German scientist uh, from Germany. He actually came to Prague, uh, where we lived for the last three years. And Harold talked a lot about the nanobot technology from the chemtrails. And he was very cautious because he is a German scientist and he was requested by the German government to see why there was so much plant life that was dying inside of Germany. What is the cause? And from his own research, he discovered that it was an airborne particle. And as they begin to really break this down in the lab, it was a nanobot technology that was causing the death of plant life in Germany. Now, it's not like to say that all of our trees are just up and dying. You don't see it with the natural eye as of yet. But Harold goes into how this is affecting the human body. And he says to the people in the interview with my wife, he said it's a 100% infection rate. He said, but what their ultimate goal is in the long run, when we got into this part of it, was that, uh, or as I should, let me stop there. Harold didn't go into that part. My wife goes into this part later, is the phone technology right now, the iPhone, you have the, what do they have? iPhone 8, I think, is out now. When they get to the iPhone 12, this generation of iPhone is supposed to be implantable in the human being, and what it will do is it will activate this nanobot technology within you. And the first thing that came to my mind when my wife spoke about this was I could not help, Steve, but think about how that uh, Jesus says, uh, or let me take it back, uh, I'll just quote the scripture, just paraphrasing from mine, because I didn't think I was going to, I didn't even think about this to start with, that I would speak about this, but that, uh, that Satan wanted to be worshipped as if he were God. He was going to sit in the temple of God and be worshipped as if he were God. That was his desire uh, before he was cast down to, to earth. Maybe that's in Isaiah 14 for all, that, for all I know. But the point was, when I looked at this, so many people are looking at a third temple in Israel that is going to be built, and this is where the Antichrist will sit. 
I don't say that that's not the case, but my point when I look at this, if Satan wants to be like God and be in the temple of God, and then we know the scripture plainly tells us that the, that the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, but a body hast thou prepared for me. Now, of course, it is a prophecy of Jesus with, with him coming, but it also is a reflection of the fact that Satan doesn't desire to go sit in the, the concrete building so much as he wants to be in your body. And he wants to be worshipped by you as he lives in your temple. And that is one of the ways that they're going to do that, Steve. And mentioning the the part about the television they're using this uh li a black lead crystal uh to make the television screens and this was another issue that uh yana talked with with harold about now i don't know if what he calls a black goo which some people will say oh you're getting all kinds of you know uh, i don't new age and stuff like that i don't care about new age that's not my point here but I, I know him as a scientist, so I want his scientific mind because he studied it. That was another thing that he was studying there. But he talks about how that it almost has like, a, a, I don't know if he used the word life of its own or whatever, but he said that it was really strange, this substance that they used. But if I'm not mistaken, this is what they're using in the TVs themselves, Steve. And that's a very demonic type of technology and very concerning to me, but... What can you expect? I mean, we know that our technology that we have today is coming from uh, these ones that are underneath the earth, which by the way, Job, I don't know if you know that, Steve, Job also talks about uh, the Raphaim being underneath the sea, literally under yes. the ocean floor. Yes, sir. So. And, and here's the deal, the abyss. One of the things that the demons didn't want to go to was the abyss. And the abyss, the deepest abyss in the channel, or excuse me, in the ocean, which would be uh, deep, would be the uh, uh, Mariana Trench, and you know, in the South Pacific. And that's where, by the way, is that's where James Cameron went in his own uh, deep submersible, like a bathysphere. And the interesting thing is, is that so many people have even typed a specific form of punishment for those who are locked up or chained in the abyss. Now, obviously, at water pressure, and I don't know how it all works. I do, I do know this. The lake of fire will be uh, fueled by the plasma and contained in a magnetic field. That's how you can deal with plasma physics, propulsion, anything. You have to have a, uh, a tremendous magnetic field. So what does this relate to? It relates to the fact that the technology of the fallen ones. I asked a general this, Stephen. And people who've listened to me all these years know it. I said, how far into the future are we? You'll hear people that basically say, oh, we're 100 years, 200 years. This general told me we're 10,000 years in the past and we're 20,000. He, he, he just gave me a number that was phenomenal into the future. So there's nothing new under the sun. So when King Solomon, the wisest man in the world up until that point, I believe this, until Jesus, he was the wisest man. He's not equal as a redeemer, but God gave the guy some tremendous understanding. So when people uh, have the knowledge of the historicity of where certain technology entered into our domain, for instance, flying saucers, the Vimana, 4,000 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Well, they don't believe it. Well, it doesn't matter anymore what you believe. If you can say, I don't believe it, show me the research, and you show them the research, so much research that in the case of the Vimanas, listen, Vimanas, the equivalent of NASA in India, went to these international confab of basically astrophysicists and rocket scientists and presented all their own detailed drawings, instructions, defined the the uh, propulsion systems, which, by the way, were based on mercury, what we used to call in, in the days, years ago, there was a thing about red mercury. It was a big deal. Mercury, mercury antimony oxide. And mercury antimony oxide can only be created in a, um, in a, like a particle accelerator. It has to be created through the processes of subatomic infusion. So the point is, is that so 4,000 years ago, we've got even, we've got areas in the world, Mahanjadero and others that are vitrified, vitrified desert. And that just simply means that the sand has been turned to glass under extreme uh, power. You can't do it with electricity. It's got to be done with a nuclear explosion fission. And so when you get into the, the ancient Indian text, they talk about the absolute 
thermonuclear power of Gurkha and his steeds, you know, basically warring in a nuclear, thermonuclear realm. Even some of the famous scientists, uh, Robert Oppenheimer of the, you know, the atom bomb fame Oppenheimer, he quotes the Mahabharata where he says, I have become the destroyer of worlds. And so what do you have? You have that as the, if you will, patron devil at CERN. And so the thing is, is that, isn't it funny? Jesus told us we needed to discern the times and we needed to have the gift of discernment. I, I think, you know, I love the words of Jesus because they're deeper than most people just blow them off. But now we're seeing a hatred. We're seeing a hatred around the world for both Jesus. Obviously, the world hates Israel. The world hates anything that has its allegiance to the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jesus, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I even have guys get mad at me when I, you know, when I write the Lord God of Heaven, I'm not Jewish, so I don't put G hyphen D or any of that stuff. They get mad at me. And I say, listen. I'm talking about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And again, you're talking about a semantic, but yet you're not living like you honor the criticism you levy. So nobody wants to be responsible. And now we've got a time, Stephen, in my opinion, where the giants are coming back. And it's my contention there are live giants now. There are my contention that there are specific black ops operators in both Russia, the United States, and China that are doing their best to acquire the DNA and the technology of the fallen. It would, in, in my company, Gen 6 Film Productions, Timothy Alberino, the writer and director of the DVDs, we have, uh, we have so many detailed accounts, eyewitness accounts of people digging up skeletons we, and, and Sardinia. And by the way, Sardinia is where the giants fled. You know, you asked me the question, well, didn't, uh, there's no place in the Word of God that basically Joshua, Caleb, killed every single giant. They fled. And even in Tunis, I believe it is, there's a pillar written by the giants saying, we are fleeing from Joshua the usurper. And from Sardinia, the, the giants fled to all off the earth. And, and today on my website, uh, well, what is today? I'm sorry. It's probably, uh, what, the 21st? I, 20, uh, yeah, 21st. It's the 21st. Yeah. 21st. There's a story that came out, and I sent it to you. You can look at it at your leisure. But now they're finding that the, the chroniclers that accompanied everybody, like from Pizarro and uh, Coronado, were talking about the, what are the Olmec, O-L-M-E-Cs, that predate the Aztecs and Incas by thousands of years, and that they were giants who built the great pyramids of Teotihuacan, Cholula, and all these other places you see. And you know what the common theme, and this is something that people just get really mad at, the common theme of the giants is they ate people. They introduced the world to cannibalism. When they fled to the South Pacific, that's where the cannibalism came from. When they uh, fled to the desert southwest, that's where the cannibalism, and I'll tell you, this is interesting. I had called one of the leading curators of uh, the Pueblo Nations at a, um, oh, a museum in Farmington New, to New, Farmington, New Mexico, and she would agree to talk on camera with us about the Sand Canyon find. Well, the Sand Canyon find was a bunch of natives who had been torn apart in pieces, and literally they could tell they were, their bones were chewed on. And then they also found, you know, evidences of you know, human DNA and specific uh, scat samples. And once she found out our position, she clammed up. She wouldn't let us, you know, do it. And yet they had already talked about. See, for many years it was a, uh, it was, uh, let's say, taboo to speak about the Native Americans in the uh, desert Southwest practicing cannibalism. Well. The whole idea was is that these giants introduced cannibalism and that the cannibals, the giants, ate up the people of the land. Just like they did in Numbers 13, 32, and 33, they did the same thing in the desert southwest. So we have film crews down there, we're talking with, and this is in the, in the uh, second DVD, or excuse me, third DVD, Holocaust of Giants. Listen, we have, I believe, been tasked, we have been anointed and appointed, not that others aren't, but we've been specifically, as God is saying, I want my people to know what's coming so they're not destroyed for lack of knowledge. You cannot get people to even believe the words of Jesus, most people, let alone talking about this stuff. But if it's in Isaiah 13, the Septuagint, if it's in the 33 uh, derivations of Rapha, the dead, uh, Rephaim, the valley of the Rephaim, 
and just literally all the other derivations, Zamzumans and all, all the things that end in IMS, then the, it's, a, it's a critical phase. It's a critical phase. So again, the idea that somehow we're just going to escape this and we've got to worry about the Russians and Chinese, which I believe we do, but beyond that is the supernatural presence of an unholy allegiance of fallen angels, demons, the reconstituted giants, and I can tell you this, I have talked to people that have been in the secret uh, underground bases and seen half human, half animals in cages crying out, help me, help me, I am human. And the, and the guy told me this, he's dead now, don't mind telling people, a CIA uh, contract agent during the Cold War and, and basically their man after the breakup of the former Soviet Union, that Russia, the point is, is that it was really interesting to see and to hear his testimony as to those underground labs. It's, it's literally like H.G. Wells, the island of Dr. Moreau. That's, that is just <clears throat> very distraught to even hear that type stuff, Steve. You know, one thing, backing up just a little bit, when we're talking about CERN, uh, you know, it brought up a couple of things to my own mind. Uh, one was the sacrifice that they were offering there. And, and I know that when that appeared on, uh, on, on social media, there was a lot of people trying to play that down. But in Russian media, they actually said that it was a real girl. She was, real ki was really killed. And they used their own technology to be able to identify her. And I forget her actual name, but they actually identified the woman that was actually killed. Uh, also, another thing about the issue about CERN was Harold Kautzvilla uh, shared with me that they tried desperately to get him on board with that project, uh, but he even said to me it was very demonic. Uh, he, he did not, uh, you, know, you know, maybe he is classified New Age himself, I can't really say myself, but he said that that was just something he would not get involved in. But he said they went so far, government officials went so far as to give him a meeting with what they, as he termed it, as aliens to try to convince him. And he said it scared him so bad. He didn't want anything to ever do with it. Uh, and he's really tried to distance himself from that particular situation. And, and another thing too, Steve, I've seen about when you were talking about the Native Americans and the bones that were gnawed upon, uh, if you look at the words that uh, Jesus uses in Matthew uh, chapter 24, when it talks about the eating part, uh, it literally comes from a Greek word that is like the gnawing or, or the crunching of bones. And sometimes people don't really catch that part of it if you're not looking at the original language or the language at least that we had it in uh, as far as the Greek language. So I think that's kind of interesting that you, that you bring those things out uh, there as well. Um, Steve, if we can, I would like to kind of set a foundation for people as well about the different types of giants that we've had down through the ages. And,